Hello there, everybody. Welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly uh, podcast in which we discuss all things Beatles, uh, both uh, uh, their their history and their uh, their current activities. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from uh, Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm joined by my cohorts, uh, Ken Michaels, the host of um, the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Good evening, Hi, Al. Ken. How Hi, are everybody. You? I'm good. How are you doing? Pretty good. And Steve Marinucci, the uh, uh, the Beatles examiner and the uh, the writer of a number of examiner columns for examiner.com. How you doing, Steve? I'm doing fine, Al. Hello, everyone. And uh, our resident musicologist, who also has been a contributor to Beatle fan over the years and uh, uh, has, uh, has has been a uh, critic and uh, Examiner of the, uh, the the classical music world and the pop music world, uh, especially the Beatle world, uh, for many years. Alan Cozen. Hi, Al. Hi, How Al. you doing? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. That's Hello, everyone. Good. This is actually part two of uh, um, of, a, of a look at our our favorite albums by each of the uh, of the four Beatles from their solo careers. And it was suggested that uh, for those who uh, might not have uh, uh, heard uh, this previous week's show, cue the announcer saying, previously on Things We Said Today, uh, last week, oh, and I, oh, I forgot somebody. I forgot Darren DeVivo, our, uh, our, one of our recurring fifth, uh, fifth panelists from, <laughs> from WFUV in New York. How quickly he forgets. How quickly I forget. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I forgot Billy Preston. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Darren DeVivo here, and I apologize. We had, I had uh, some sort of um, connection problem in last week's show, part one, where we talked about Ringo and John, and about three quarters of the way through the show, unbeknownst to me, my audio disappeared on my computer, so I was talking to myself for a few minutes, which is actually pretty normal for me. Um, <laughs> and nobody was responding, and I was getting offended, and then I realized, wait a minute, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> but uh, hopefully I'll be here for the full hour, and thank you for inviting me back. And along with some other distractions, um, the last week's show kind of ended in a jumble, but Ken did an excellent job of uh, kind of knitting the the end uh, together. Uh, but for, oh, those, you, for those who didn't hear last week's show, uh, just to very quickly let you know what we, uh, what we decided as far as our favorite albums by John Lennon and Ringo Starr, for, uh, for John, Alan chose... Double Fantasy. Double Fantasy, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Steve chose Plastic Ono Band. Uh, Ken and I uh, both chose Mind Games, and uh, Darren chose Walls and Bridges. Yep. So not a real big consensus there. Uh, for Ringo, Alan chose Time Takes Time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve chose Why Not. And the other three of us all chose, the uh, unsurprisingly, the, the 1973 Ringo LP. Mm-hmm. So, so tonight we have uh, maybe more of a challenge here. Now, should we flip a coin and see whether we want to go with George or Paul first? I would say go with George first. Okay. Because I have a feeling that most of us will say the same thing, although I was wrong about that before. And Paul, I have no idea what all of you are going to say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's so many albums to pick from from Paul, so that might be the biggest surprise coming from the five of us. So why don't we go with George first? Okay, and since I think we all know what your choice is going to be, why don't we start with you, Ken? Uh, my favorite album from George is Living in the Material World, and I think a <laughs> lot of people are surprised by that because everyone will point to All Things Must Pass, and there's no doubt about it, All Things Must Pass is beyond great as far as i'm concerned when you've got great songs and you've got two albums of great songs it's kind of hard to compare that to anything else in a solo career but i choose living in the material world because i love the spiritual side of george and although there's a lot of spiritual songs throughout his entire uh solo catalog 
The songs on that album, Living in the Material World, hit me the hardest. They are the most personal songs, I think, from his solo career. I think certain songs like The Light That Has Lighted the World, uh, Who Can See It, Be Here Now, uh, The Day the World Gets Round, those are amongst the most powerful songs in terms of the lyrics and what he's saying in those songs. If you listen to a song like The Light That Has Lighted the World, it's kind of ironic if you follow what George said in his book, I Me Mine. He first wrote that song for Cilla Black to record because it was relating to the fact that Cilla was becoming a big star. She moved from Liverpool to London. It was like the, the small town girl makes good and it's not the same anymore. You know, now that she's made it to the big time and people who grew up with her, maybe in Liverpool, were thinking that. So when George ended up recording his version, you can certainly see how the lyrics in that song relate to him. There are a lot of fans out there that would like for him to remain Beatle George and stay in the past, you know, but he was moving on with his life. And certainly with the success of All Things Must Pass and the concert for Bangladesh, you know, he was becoming his own person. And uh, that song is just very powerful in what he's saying, that he's grateful to the people out there who recognize him for who he is and what he's become instead of, you know, clinging to the past. The same thing with a song like Who Can See It. It's very much in that vein. And Be Here Now is one of the most powerful songs that any artist, I think, has ever done. What I love most about that song, and I think I might have said this uh, a few shows ago, is that it's very much a mantra to me. There are very few words in that song, but that also makes each word become more important. And it's all about living in the present, not living in the past. And because there are so few words, and each word takes up a measure of the song, he's driving the point home, I think, with what he's trying to convey message-wise in that song. And the fact that it's just him and an acoustic guitar, I believe there's a harmonium in there too, but that's it. It's stripped down to just that. Makes you listen to what he's trying to say. And either you're really interested in George's point of view and what he's trying to say in that song, or you're bored by it. In many ways, I, I kind of think that's his Within You, Without You of his solo career. Mm -hmm. Within yeah. You, Without You is one of those songs that you either were bored by because it's all this Indian music and it goes on for five minutes long and you're waiting for when I'm 64, <laughs> like some people did, right. you know, or you take the time to listen to what he's saying in the song. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it either means something to you or it doesn't. And with me, you know, the songs in, in this particular album and The Day the World Gets Round as well, they're all very powerful for what he's saying as far as personal messages. In many ways, I kind of think of the songs on this album, the ones that mean the most to him, as sort of being his own Plastic Ono band. Mm. I know nobody looks at it that way, mm. but because Plastic Ono was so deeply personal and so raw and so intense, this is George saying things from his own perspective in that regard. So, um, and that is all, I think, is one of the greatest love songs ever written. Mm -hmm. I would put it on the same plane as something, which I know everybody looks at as being, you know, the great love song from George Harrison, and it is a great love song. Mm -hmm. uh, that is all is equal to me in every aspect. It's one of the most gorgeous melodies ever done. The fact that Andy Williams chose to cover it says a lot, mm -hmm. uh, as, well as, as well as Harry Nilsson. Sure. And I love the slide guitar playing throughout this album, although I love it throughout his entire body of work. I love the slide solo on The Lord Loves the One, the single Forgive Me Love. The, the slide guitar work on that is impeccable. That was a great single. Um, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long would have made a great second single. Very catchy, mm -hmm. commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love everything about this album. Try Some, Buy Some, which he resurrected from uh, the sessions with Ronnie Spector, was first written for Ronnie took the same backing tracks, put his own vocals on it, and it really suited him to a T, you know. And I, that's a very complex song, too, in terms of the melody. There's a lot of different time changes in it. It's very, very different, and I love, from a musical point of view, the complexity of that song and George's vocals on it, singing in such a high range, too. In every way, I love Living in the Material World. I love that album mainly because the songs, I think, meant more to George than on other albums. And I know his music is very personal on so much of his work, 
and I won't deny it on his other albums. Mm -hmm. But that's why I love that particular album. It really touched me. It touched the nerve in me that still, I mean, opinions change through the years, but mine hasn't changed about that album. If anything, I just appreciate it even more now than I ever have. In fact, now you consider that to be your favorite album by anybody, right? That's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if you look at the Beatles group and solo stuff, many of their albums are amongst my favorites sure, huh? of all time. Mm -hmm. So, but that would be the one. Uh, and it's kind of funny for me to say that because I've always been more of a melody guy. Yeah. And, and arrangements, which is why I, I really think so highly of Paul in particular. But, um, you know, I haven't been that heavily a lyrics guy, but yet, it's because these songs are so personal to George mm -hmm. that really that really touched me uh, in a special way, and it still resonates to this day. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. I have a question for you, Ken. Yes. Yeah. Did you uh, did you um, were you exposed to the album when it was first released in '73 or or later on? In '73. Um, the thing is, throughout my childhood, I heard all the Beatles group stuff as it was happening, and I might mm. not have gotten each album as it was released, but I got it fairly soon. Same thing with the early solo Beatles stuff. But I know 1973 was my year of awakening, mm. and uh, that was when I was getting each album as it came out immediately, within a week, right. say, of its right. release. So, uh, you know, 1973 will always be the most special year for me as a Beatles fan, because of everything that came out mm -hmm. that year. Very true. Living in the Material World, Mind Games, which, like I said, is my favorite Lennon album, as it is yours, Al. Mm -hmm. The Ringo album, which is still my favorite Ringo album. And Paul also had Band on the Run right. and <laughs> Red Rose Speedway right. and Live and Let Die in, in the middle. So how can you possibly, between 1973 and 1970, those are the two greatest years in terms of output and even of the solo Beatles. and even the red and blue albums which a lot of the uh what you might call the second generation beatle fans it was through those two albums that a lot of younger beatle fans discovered the group that's true yeah, and that mm -hmm. was also you know, in 73 right <clears throat> plus billy preston had a great year that yeah. year so mm -hmm. I've said it before, the stars were aligned just right in 1973 in a way that it hasn't been since, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, yeah, that, that has a lot to do also with my feelings about living in the material world because 1973 was the greatest year for me as a Beatle fan in terms of the music that came out of them. Hmm. Very true. Darren, why don't we uh, get, your, get your choice for your favorite George album? Absolutely. Thank you. And Ken, I really enjoyed with what you had to say about living in the material world. And I couldn't agree with you more in every aspect. Um, mm. I absolutely love living in the material world. Um, and I think I'd say that it's my favorite album cover by any of the four Beatles when it comes to album artwork. Beautifully mm. packaged album, too, uh, to right. go along with the music. George, for me, was, is the most consistent of the four of them. Perhaps, in my opinion, for the exception of Extra Texture, read all about it, my opinion, George never made a bad album. And I could even find qualities in Extra Texture that I like. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think his output from beginning to end was, uh, was more consistent than the other, the other three Beatles. And I have always, uh, at one time or another, loved all of George's albums. Uh, but for the most part, it always comes down to three of them. And Ken said one, living in the material world. The other is the obvious one, all things must pass. But this isn't about what three albums uh, I like of George Harrison. If I had to narrow it down to one, I'd have to go with the first album that I got when it was brand new, and that's thirty three and a third. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, yeah. that's gonna that's gonna be my pick uh, <laughs> for my favorite George Harrison album. And perhaps it was perhaps it's because it was my first George Harrison album uh, as a solo artist. I was eleven years old in seventy six. Um, I turned eleven early in the year, and um, for whatever reason. I didn't have much money when I was 11, so I probably asked for 33 and a third, and uh, to this day, think it's a flawless album. All Things Must Pass, as as 
monumental as it is, if you're looking at it and discussing it as an album as a whole, you do have to take the Apple Jam section into account. And mm -hmm. for me, that's a very small minus that drops it below 33 and a third and maybe living in the material world. Pound for pound, every song on 33 and the third is great. George gets a little funky on the album. Uh, <laughs> I think he's revitalized in a big way. I think uh, George, a bit of malaise had come over George, whether it was um, the, the lambasting that he got from the critics for the world tour with Ravi Shankar or the North American tour hmm. uh, with Ravi Shankar in 74. Uh, perhaps some of the uh, not-so-nice comments that were uh, given to the Dark Horse and Extra Texture albums, you know, were getting on George's case, perhaps the Apple situation. Whatever the case might be, he really came, made a comeback. Artistic 33 and a third, his first album on his own label, Dark Horse Records. Sorry, that was my rocket launcher. Um, uh, but um, it really showed a revitalized George uh, working with a great... He always had a knack for rounding up some of the best musicians to play with. And 33 and a third is uh, no exception. I mean, it's got it all in there. It's funky. It rocks. It's a little R&B, dare I say... In the case of learning how to love you, there's a little smidge of smooth jazz in there. Um, yeah, it's just in all, uh, in all, for all intents and purposes, uh, is my favorite one. And and I would pick it slightly ahead of living in the material world, only because sometimes living in the material world is such a a serious listen that if you know the windows are down in the car and uh, you're driving around and the sun is out, I might go for thirty three and a third first before living in the material world. So uh, that's that's my pick, uh, 33 and a third, uh, for my favorite George Harrison album. Very mm. interesting. That's one of my favorites, too. <laughs> uh, now, let's see. Uh, I suspect we may get a vote here for, for electronic sound, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just to find out for sure, let's see what Steve's uh, choice is. <laughs> I thought for sure you would say Alan for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, I, I went through, this was a hard question for me because I love George's albums. I went, uh, one of the considerations was Brainwashed, um, but it's a, I think it's a little, uh, there are some beautiful moments on Brainwashed, mm -hmm. but it's a little uneven. So I said no. Uh, somewhere in England was another consideration. I especially like the four songs that showed up on bootleg that uh, didn't make the original cut. Sure. But, so that that's the reason I left that one. Um, the George Harrison uh, album, I love the George Harrison album. Uh, I love the you know the first several songs, the the way that starts in with "Love Comes to Everyone," mm -hmm. um, "Blow Away," "Faster." I love those. But in the end, the winner was Cloud Nine. Um, mm -hmm. I. Really, really, uh, Cloud Nine is is got to be his strongest album altogether, as far as I'm concerned. Um, from the beginning to end, it's 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 just excellent. Um, you know, he uh, Cloud Nine is a great song. Uh, that's what it takes with uh, co-written with uh, Jeff Lynne and Gary Wright. Fish on the Sand, uh, just for today, is absolutely beautiful. Um, mm. When we when we was fab, I love all the. Uh, I love the the uh, all the versions of that that have been floating around the 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 long version with the extra long ending. I think that's wonderful. The uh, Devil's Radio is a, is another great song. Someplace Else is another beautiful song. Wreck of the Hesperus is probably one of the few that I have a little less um, uh, enthusiasm about, but it's mm -hmm. still not bad. Breath Away from Heaven is great, and Got My Mind Set on You is just absolutely fantastic. So it, all all in all, Cloud Nine. Really, I mean, there's just so many. There's hardly a down moment on that on that album, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I ha I'd have to give it to that. It's it's just strong all the way through from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So there, another another fine choice because that's a mm -hmm. another one, another favorite of mine. So will electronic sound be your uh, your choice? 
Uh, no, because um, I mean, I sort of re- I had lunch with Bernie Krause once, and he was, you know, it was it was maybe ten years after Electronic Sound, and he was still, yeah, you know, very that. upset about uh-huh. what happened with that. And, and he said, mm-hmm. you know, these were these were not pieces; these were practice tapes. And not only are they practice tapes, but a lot of it's me. And uh, so, uh, while I would love to do the strangest possible choice um i can't really do electronic sound although i i, I kind of like it i don't i don't think it's as bad as people think and it, it strikes me as better than practice tapes but um for various reasons i i can't choose that one um I agree with what Darren said about George's albums being consistent, um, and I, I, I agree with basically what everybody has said. I mean, it's uh, George's. It's it's kind of interesting. I mean, talk about a dark horse. Um, he, when you look at his stuff now, in in a way, his catalog is uniquely strong. I mean, um, I have to say I'm more of a group guy than a solo guy. Mm. Um, always have been. And in the beginning of, uh, say, say the 70s, I didn't actually pay that much attention to the solo things apart from John. A little bit George. I, I mean, I, I loved All Things Must Pass when it came out. I went to the concert for Bangladesh and I loved that when the album when it came out. And um, I, I actually didn't at the time like living in the material world that much. It, it, had, it struck me as a little bit whiny and it sort of turned me off. I mean, I, I don't feel that way now. I've revisited and thought, you know, what, what was I thinking? Uh, but I kind of know mm. what I was thinking. But, but nevertheless, um, I, I sort of stopped paying attention. I mean, with Paul, I listened to, you know, Band on the Run and Venus and Mars and various things, but but a lot of the other stuff got past me until about 1980, and mm. I guess there was a lull in the uh, Beatles bootleg world at the time, and <laughs> you know, lacking anything else to get, I began snapping up all the solo albums and listening to them and getting to know them. And um, but looking at it now, I mean, in this past week when I've tried to sort of choose my George album, I mean. All Things Must Pass, I mean, I think everyone agrees. I mean, that was sort of a floodgate opening, and you know, he had all these things he had been saving up, not getting on Beatles albums, and um, they're just incredible songs. I, I, I don't necessarily agree that you have to think about the Jam album, because if I recall correctly, mm-hmm. that was a three-disc set for the price of two, so exactly. the Jam exactly. album was free. Yeah, <laughs> very true. So... So we, we, we could discount that. And I, I, I have to admit, I hardly ever listened to that disc. But um, yes. And then Cloud Nine, I thought, you know, that was going to be my choice because it was, you know, really a, a comeback. And it is such a strong album for the reasons Steve said. And I kind of went through almost every single one. I mean, Wonderwall. I love Wonderwall. I uh, got that when it came out. And um, it, it just has so much interesting stuff on it. But what I settled on was the George Harrison album from 1979. Because as I listened to them this week, I mean, that really stood out for a number of reasons, largely to do with the variety of things on it and the variety of George's interests represented on it. Um, I mean, you've got Faster, you know, mm-hmm. his, his uh, auto racing fascination, Soft-hearted Hannah is about um, various kinds of mushrooms that you might ingest and see pretty pictures. Uh. (laughs) Um, Mm. Not guilty. I mean, of course, we all know that as a a Beatles outtake. Um, It had been widely bootlegged by the time this album came out, I think, actually. Maybe not that widely. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, and and ultimately, you know, years after this, we heard the Easter tapes, the first version of it, and then it ends up on Mm -hmm. the anthology. So some, you know, some hindsight, but the song is basically the same song that he did as a member of the Beatles. And it deals with, you know, not wanting to upset the apple cart. That's pretty you know, out there open. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's... uh, didn't mean to sort of waylay you on your road to man's lay with every gurus came along. You know, it, mm. it, it deals with a lot of his issues 
that, that were Beatles issues. You yes. Know? And it's kind of interesting that in 1979, this is still on his mind. Yeah. Um, Love Comes to Everyone is a beautiful song. Mm-hmm. Um, Here Comes the Moon, you know, we're getting back, like, not, not guilty. We've got sort of a, a different take of a Beatlesque kind of song he's mm-hmm. done here comes the sun here comes the moon blow away is a beautiful song i love that um i love the video for it i love the video for faster too you know and it's if you believe you know touches on his spiritual side um but he's at this point doing it in a way that doesn't sound preachy i mean it you could you could listen to if you believe and take it even as not particularly a spiritual song just you know the the power of believing that you can do what you want to do you know it's there you can do it um Mm -hmm. um, but there is you know knowing that it's george you you have that undercurrent of spirituality too so um this album you know it just seemed to me that it's often neglected um it comes in the middle of a bunch of other things that are perhaps you know bigger draws for people but uh when i played it this week there were just so many things about it that made me think yeah 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 that the feeling of when i first got the album which was uh, you know a bit after it came out um and saw the videos and all of those things it it just uh it just struck me as a, a very enjoyable album that i don't know if i would take it to a desert island instead of all things must pass but mm-hmm. But for our purposes, um, that was my choice. Uh, that's a good point, Alan, about uh, if you had to take one, though, to a desert island, you might go with All Things Must Pass. Because mm-hmm. I think that I would do the same thing, uh, even though I just picked 33 and a third. But uh, that, that was an interesting point that you made there. The George Harrison album also is one, I should have said, uh, four. There's not a trio, but a uh, uh, set of four albums for me that are virtually perfect. And I should have mentioned George Harrison in that, Mm because I also look at that as being important in George's life, because it was the first Olivia album, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's true. Right. John uh, often expressed his love for Yoko, as did Paul with Linda. For the George Harrison album, that was his, uh, there were several tunes in there for Olivia. Dark Sweet Lady. Right, right. Yep. Your Love is Forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I'm, but I'm just looking at the list on, on uh, my iTunes, and I, I really could have chosen any of these. I mean, I love Gone Trapo. I got that one when it came out, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I may have been one of the four people who actually paid money for it. Um, I'm, I'm one of the four. I'm, <laughs> I'm also one okay. of the four. Well, here well, we I go. Have, <laughs> we're all I here. Have, well, you have, you I have, have more than four, then. I have one of the uh, promo, the weird promo copies of the of Gontropo, the the weird pressing. I can't remember. I, I it's in the other room, so I can't look at it right now. But there's a there was a weird uh, label on the on the promo pressings, and I have one of those. It was the so, do, uh, they used a certain kind of vinyl, Warner Brothers supposedly, right. uh-huh. and it was mm-hmm. was it Quiex, I think something like that. Something like yeah. that. yeah, right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Being in radio, everything that Warner Brothers put out had that on there, and I <laughs> never quite re- thought, you know, is this a big deal? Because it sounds like every other record. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, I got mine when I was uh, uh, when I was on the uh, my college re- newspaper, and that's uh, what came in, and, and they gave it to me. So that's how it, that's how that happened. Well, so that leaves you, Al. anyway. Yeah, and we are going to be in a situation we were we are not going to have a consensus because uh, these are all albums. The ones that you guys chose are all albums that I that I very much either love or admire. But note for note, song for song, as Darren said, pound for pound, I have I always end up going back. So all things must pass. Uh, it's you know I you know granted the the, the you know the, a lot of those songs are actually from the Beatle era, but still the the fact that this many superior songs are in uh, one package and we'll eliminate the third disc <laughs> well, you know, from mm-hmm. the uh, from the discussion, but just the two. The two discs, the first two discs alone, 
I mean, you could take side one and side three, and you'd have a an absolute classic. And but then you wouldn't have what is life, and you wouldn't have behind that locked door, and you wouldn't have let it down, and you wouldn't have run of the mill. And if not for you, and if not for you, yes, exactly. That's very true. Uh, and so that's, you know, the, the old, uh, back in the old FM days, the classic album sides, you've really got four classic album sides here. I mean, the, the, it's, it's, you know, really every song on here is, is very, very strong in, in one form or another. Plus the fact that obviously you have, uh, you know, a huge worldwide number one song in, in My Sweet Lord and a very strong second single in, in What Is Life. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, um, it really shows what George was capable of and what you know, unfortunately, with the two heavyweight songwriters ahead of him in the Beatles, uh, he wasn't able to really show to the extent that he would have liked. Obviously, especially at the last two or three Beatles albums, there are some classic Harrison songs. I shouldn't, I shouldn't even say two or three, uh, really almost throughout, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the lifespan of the group. Um, George gave some, you know, very, very good material, but especially, especially on Abbey Road and especially on the White Album. But at the same time, he had these songs piling up and, uh, was able to finally, um, you know, give them to the world with all things must pass. And so for me, uh, you know, as much as I, as much as I love 33 and the third and Cloud Nine, and the George Harrison album, uh, it's got to be, it's got to be All Things Must Pass. Can I just say one Please. thing? I'm actually stunned that all four of you didn't say All Things Must Pass, because that particular album is, is generally thought of as being not only the best George Harrison album, but the best solo Beatle album by a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And when you consider the fact that you've got two albums of strong material compared to, in many cases, one album of very strong material... I just find it, it's really, if anything, it's a testament to how strong George's solo catalog is, that it's Mm -hmm. widespread Mm -hmm. in our picks between the five of us. But I really was expecting the rest of you to to all go with All Things Must Pass. Right. I, uh, you know, I knew that your selection would be Material World, but I really was not expecting that, uh, that we would all have, the, the, the other four of us would all have a different choice. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Now I wonder mm-hmm. if this is going to happen with with Paul. Well, you've got over thirty doesn't. albums to pick from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm expecting it to be widespread. Exactly. So. Did anybody else have any other comments about uh, our our George selections? I just would uh, to, to echo what Ken just said. It's a testament to the quality of George's solo work that the five of us uh, ultimately all picked different albums we all agreed there's nothing like old things must pass Mm -hmm. and we all on any given day might be in the mood for each other's picks does that make sense each other's Mm -hmm. you know on any Mm -hmm. given day i might like like completely get taken over by living in the material world and you know so it's really a testament to the uh uh, George Harrison's uh, the quality of his work. So that's true. That's true, and that's also not to uh, not to denigrate uh, brainwashed, which I, right. I you know which is a uh, you know under you know given the, given the circumstances is uh, is a wonderful album. Right. Yeah, that's the and I, reason I, why I can't listen to brainwashed that often because it just is mm-hmm. is sad. It yeah. Just, it, you know. Yeah. That's the only uh, when I heard it, I thought this is unbelievable. Even on his deathbed, this man comes out with a, a, a near masterpiece. Mm-hmm. And boy, is this going to blow people away when they hear this? Maybe I don't know. If maybe I overreacted a bit, but it didn't hold up for me as time went by because it, it just has this cloud hanging over it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What kind of cloud? Just that it, he was dying when he made most of the album, and that he was no longer with us, and it was his. 
you know, posthumously released swan song. That's all. Hmm. Okay. Yes, I guess sort of like um, the the fact that a lot of people have a tough time that uh, it, there are, will be certain times when double fantasy can be mm-hmm. uh, a tough listen because that album is so unfortunately associated uh, with what happened two two and a half weeks after its release. Right. So I mm-hmm. totally totally understand your feelings on that. So. Shall we uh shall we go to our selections for Mr. McCartney? Absolutely. All right. Okay. And I think Let's we'll start again and put the pressure on Ken. <laughs> I'm feeling the pressure right now. <laughs> <laughs> now definitely it is Flowers in the Dirt for me. And the reason why I love Flowers in the Dirt is because I think because my impression of Paul has changed through the years quite a lot. I've always admired his mastery of so many different genres of music, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I admire him so much. And I think he, he became more of his own artist after Wings. I think he really grew um, from the 80s on up in many ways, um, which is not to say I don't love the 70s, Paul. I love you know everything just about from the 70s. But when Paul is, is um, recording so many different styles of music and doing it well, Mm-hmm. on the same album, that's when I admire him the most. And we were talking about Tug of War. Mm-hmm. We were talking about Tug of War with Tom Frangione, and that's another example of him being the master of so many different styles of music. When you when you look at Flowers in the Dirt, there are no two finer, really great pop songs than My Brave Face and this one. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. they're really well-constructed, great melodies, catchy as hell, you know, you can't help but sing along with those two songs. And then at the same time, I love a song like Rough Ride, where you've got the brass, the, the horn section in there. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the, the letting go feel mm-hmm. uh, in some ways. Um, I love his collaboration with Elvis Costello, like in My Brave Face. And, and I love You One or Two a lot, although there are times when it seems to me like that was Paul and Elvis doing their own The Girl Is Mine, yeah. in a way. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, two guys fighting over the same girl. So that was their version of that. But they sound so great together. And, you know, I love the whole melody and the whole arrangement. And I love that quirky end, at, at uh, the way the song ends. Distractions is a masterpiece to me. I love that song. It's very light. It's mm-hmm. soft. It's got a jazzy feel to it. I've never heard Paul do a song in that particular vein up to that point that I can remember. I'm not just talking about ballads. Mm-hmm. I'm just talking about the way that it's arranged. And unlike um, what you guys said during our Tug of War show, I loved We Got Married from the very beginning. And We Got Married another one of those songs that has all these different sections in them that got strung together in a way where it makes a lot of sense. And I like the way that it ends very jazzy with the trumpet solo mm-hmm. at the end. Um, Put It There is another nice acoustic song from Paul. And ironically, uh, you know, I love Put It There. I just wish that he developed the song a little bit more and put a middle eight in there or something because it kind of ends too soon for me. You can have a short song like Put It There um, and still have it, and and still it can feel like a complete song the way that I Will is a complete song to me. But Put It There is lacking something there. It just, it needed a middle eight, something like a bridge somewhere to go back to the main um, verses of the song. I love Figure of Eight, although it's the only rocker on on the album and it needs to rock a little more, which is the only weakness, I think, of the album is that it needed a rocker. Um, this one, like I said, perfect pop song from Paul. It's it, it ranks way up there, as does My Brave Face as being one of the great pop. You know, when I think of pop and I think Penny Lane and mm-hmm. I think Listen to What the Man Said and With a Little Luck, those are great pop songs. This one is one of those songs of that caliber mm-hmm. to me. One of my favorite songs, ironically, in this album is Don't Be Careless Love, mm. which is the weirdest, might be the weirdest song on the album. <laughs> and it was the one that took me the, the longest to appreciate. But I love what Paul's doing in that song with his vocals. You know, the real high register. He's really trying to, you know, he, he's singing so well in a high register, you're not used to hearing him sing that high. And, uh, and it's it's a song that's kind of quirky and clunky, and yet 
in its own way, it's a Paul and Elvis song, and it makes sense as a Paul and Elvis song, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense at all. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. How Many People, great reggae tune, great hook to that one. I love that one. Motor of Love is another great love song from Paul. Really has a Beach Boys feel to it. Love what Greg Hawks brought to the song from the Cars. The whole production behind that, I love a lot. That Day is Done. That's a masterpiece. Yeah. That Day is Done is a great gospel-y song in the vein of Let It Be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a very unusual, dark song for Paul to sing. You know, taken from the view of someone who's being buried, you mm -hmm. know, at his own grave. Uh, another great collaboration with Paul and Elvis. You know, we could do a show on who we think was Paul's best collaborator after the Beatles. Mm. I wonder how you guys feel about that. Mm. But um, And I love Oué Le Soleil a lot. It's a great dance track. It's got a few lines, and that's it. I don't look at it as some, you know, masterwork from Paul, but it's a fun track to put at the end of, of the album. So song per song, I love really every song on Flowers in the Dirt. So, um, and he's, he's conquering so many different styles of music. That's who Paul McCartney is for me. Going back to the early days of the Beatles. Another bus coming through the window. <laughs> <laughs> and then extending into his solo career. I really admire when he's able to write in so many different styles of music as he did back in the Beatle days and throughout his entire solo career. And when he does something like that and does it well, as he did on Tug of War, as he did on Flowers in the Dirt. Those are the albums that I admire a lot. And there's many other albums from Paul's solo career that I would consider to be, as I rank them, you know, a 10 out of 10. But Flowers in the Dirt is one of them, and it's my personal favorite. And since it, I made it a favorite, it stayed that way. Mm -hmm. So, And just parenthetically, since you mentioned that the, the album version a figure of eight is not quite the rocker that it should have been. The uh, both the second studio version, which was released as a single in England, and right. and then of course obviously the version that he did live, beginning on the the eighty nine ninety uh, world tour, uh, definitely top the version that's uh, the you know the the album version. I would agree with that. Yeah. I think the one on the album is is rather tender. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Darren, what's your choice? Well, uh, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. As I pointed out earlier when I said I was 11 years old, when 33 and a third came out, everyone could pretty much figure out that I'm 50 now this year, and I'm the mm. baby amongst the five of us. So I picked up on a lot of music after the fact. Uh, and I grew up in the 70s, and for some reason, and I probably never will know why, even as early as four years of age, there was something that attracted me uh, to the music of the Beatles, and, and then quickly after that, there was something that pulled me towards Paul as my favorite Beatle. I don't know what it was, but it was there from as early as four years old. So um, McCartney was my favorite Beatle from for, from my day one. So uh, the 70s growing up, Wings were the soundtrack to my youth, to my life. And, uh, you know, virtually all of the albums, especially starting with Venus and Mars, which was the first, I think, was the first solo album I bought when it was current. Mm -hmm. uh, those are albums that are just, uh, you know, the priceless to me, uh, the Wings albums of the 70s. So I'm going to go with my pick to, to try to get to the point because there's, I've just got so many opinions about <laughs> so many different McCartney albums and and, they're, and the body of work is so large that, you know, you know I could go on and on about to talk, it's talking about how the how I loved Press to Play and thought Tug of War was overrated. Uh, maybe that's for another show. But uh, I'll get right to the point, and my pick is Band on the Run, uh, which in my estimation was about as close to perfect of an album that McCartney did. Uh, Ram, a very close runner-up, and uh, but, you know, uh, for me, again, it was a Wings album. I remember vividly having it on cassette, 
and uh, getting Red Rose Speedway right around the same time on cassette. And I played those tapes over and over and over again. And uh, uh, Band on the Run is perfection from beginning to end. Paul has always frustrated me a little bit, even though he's my favorite, that all of his albums, you could find a tune that you might consider, uh, this could be the album's clunker. Mm-hmm. For me, Band on the Run was the hardest to find a song that I would put in that category. And the American version, I think, is better for including Helen Wheels. Something's missing when I listen to the uh, UK version, which I guess is kind of regarded as the uh, standard. But um, so I throw uh, my vote to uh, Band on the Run as my Paul McCartney pick. Did you do you have a clunker uh, on that album mm-hmm. or yeah, uh, that's which, like a, like I said that I mean for Band on the Run that's the you may know maybe the same thing with Ram those are the two albums I find I find it hardest to find a clunker I guess if I had to it would be that middle portion of uh, Picasso's last words drink to me mm-hmm. where it meanders a little bit but yet the meandering is sort of bringing in, uh, you know, a little element of Jet and another element of uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt. Right. And kind of at the same time, while it might be a bit of a lull, it also kind of makes the album as a cohesive whole mm-hmm. uh, work. I don't think of it as a concept album uh, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but, uh, you know, it kind of ties together as a complete work with those little bits that appear in the middle of uh, Picasso's last words, Drink to Me. Yeah. But uh, I I agree with everything that Ken said about Flowers in the Dirt, which I think is a very important McCartney album. I've always thought Flaming Pie arguably might be his best late period album. I always loved Press to Play because I thought at a time when Paul was uh, starting to get labeled as a soft rocker and kind of like drifted into... M.O.R. type material, uh, Press to Play was kind of a ballsy record to come out at a time when I felt he needed to put out something that was right down the middle, and he didn't. He did something that was completely left of center. And uh, mm. and Ram, I think, is uh, also uh, my, my 1B, but 1A goes to Band on the Run, mm-hmm. the uh, third Wings album. Okay, you can tell that we're all kind of wrestling with our choices here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Steve, what's yours? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep up my uh, tradition of being uh, uh, different. Uh oh. <laughs> and uh, you know, in in running down, and I know uh, this is probably gonna stir up a couple of uh, at least a couple of you, or at least one of you. But uh, I think a consistent problem with Paul's albums is they've been real slick. You know, they've been all very polished, which in some respects isn't a bad thing. They've been very melodic. They've been very predictable. They've been, and I'm not, I know that sounds like a criticism, but it's, it, it kind of isn't. I mean, he's been very commercial. He's always been very commercial. That's one of his, his best qualities, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. Mm-hmm. And the, and the one album, uh, solo album, uh, outside of the avant garde things that has been the least in that regard, least polished, least, uh, um, predictable mm-hmm. is McCartney, and I. Oh. And so I'm choosing. I, I'm choosing McCartney. Um, you know, from the very beginning, it's it sounds like a, you know a, a very rough album. You know, I love the way uh, uh, um, this, it sound. Well, it sounds like it was done in a garage almost, mm. and and I love that. Um, a couple of the songs uh, were taken from were things that he had tested out during the get back sessions. Nice. Um, and of course, and, and, you know, but, uh, the songs are all great. He was very, uh, he was very, uh, independent at that point. He hadn't, you know, it, it was, he was fresh off the Beatles. There was still a lot of Beatle aura surrounding him. And I don't know if that's part of the reason for my liking this or not mm-hmm. because of that, because it is, it is pretty close to the Beatles. The one track though that, that absolutely elevates this album incredibly is maybe i'm amazed i mean that was absolutely brilliant from the first i i thought it was uh incredible from the first time i heard it and it's still now 
sounds wonderful in concert and you know but i mean the whole album is just is just great as unpolished and as as rough and as human as it sounds um i think it 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 shows McCartney's personality maybe a little more than some of the other albums. It, there's not much hidden here. Um, we know why he put it out. We know the circumstances. Um, he wasn't trying to just put out a, a piece of product to be commercial. He was trying to put out a product to make a statement, and he definitely makes a statement here. And uh, so I, uh, I, I really think that. Uh, everything about this album is just uh, amazing. Uh, even the even the songs that you don't think are great uh, are, you know, are just uh, they all fit in. They all fit the pu- into the puzzle nicely, and and I think for that reason, McCartney would be my choice. Has to be. Let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Um, since your uh, since your your choice was kind of based on the fact that McCartney. That the McCartney album is a little rougher than some of the the later work. Um, mm-hmm. Why then didn't you choose, say, Wildlife? <laughs> because McCartney came first. Okay. And because, and good, because, good reason. And, well, and, and because McCartney, um, there was just so much around it that happened, and I mm-hmm. think Wildlife was somewhat incidental, given the history of it. Um, yeah. It wasn't as up front, and if you want to use the word historic, you can use the word historic, I suppose, sure. because McCartney is definitely historic. Of course. But I think I think uh, it stands out more than Wildlife does. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't even think of, you know, I didn't. I have to be honest. I didn't even think about Wildlife. Um, I think McCartney is just. It's been a that's been a personal favorite of mine since it came out. So, and Wildlife not so much. Mm-hmm. So. Very quickly, I would love to have uh, have heard McCartney when it first came out because I always thought it was a very interesting move on his part. His first work as a solo artist, his follow-up to Abbey Road uh, would be an album that was so rough and unfinished sounding. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I would have been, if I was a musician in his boat, uh, in his shoes, I'd be pulling out all the stops and making something that was this grand statement and try to make a perfect masterpiece. And Paul went the exact opposite and decided I'd, I'll include the little bit that I ad libbed to make sure the tape recorder was working, uh, which was the lovely mm-hmm. Linda, and mm-hmm. I'll do this drum thing at the end. So it's just really a, a very interesting decision on his part to do uh, the type that type album for his first solo mm-hmm. statement. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it 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 goes against everything he basically almost everything he's ever done after it. Even uh, you know, I I mean, I suppose you could bring in Wildlife and say yeah, but this was the one that that led the way that stuck out like a sore thumb, you mm-hmm. know. And on top of it, and and that doesn't even we're not even going to discuss the interview that came along with it. Oh well, I mean of that yeah. you know, but I mean that. That's also part of the part of the, the part of the story, story. Yeah. right? But I yeah. mean, because I remember, I remember hearing about this coming out. I remember, in fact, I remember hearing on the, hearing the radio on the day that they announced that the Beatles were breaking up and that McCartney was going to do a solo album. And I remember the uh, announcer almost uh, almost happy. Uh, he did. He was doing his his uh, uh, promo for it and. Uh, I can remember the announcer doing his lead in on the on the story and almost being gleeful and then he said the Beatles are breaking up and I and I went what you know and and it was like oh my god you know and and uh I mean this is when obviously you know the establishment was still looking down at the Beatles they didn't think of them as you know they didn't have the respect for them that they did later on but I know that uh I mean it was it was amazing, and and the McCartney album just kind of floated into this, the way it you know the way it came in, and and of course and, and again you know there was all the situation after with the uh, feelings about uh, against McCartney. There was a lot of an, animosity against him at the time mm-hmm. um, that took a long time to to. But that has not I'm, that is not part of the that's not part of the reason why I picked the album. I'm just saying that the uh, the album itself was just. Uh, historic and and it was just it's just completely a, a, 
a totally different McCartney than than almost than we knew later. Mm-hmm. So, Ken, huh. I think Ken had a follow up. Uh oh. Uh oh. No, it's right. no, it's it's a few things I just want to bring up. First of all, you said McCartney tends to be predictable. I think he's the least predictable mm. artist we've had. Mm. <laughs> you never know what out al- when he puts out an album, what he's going to put out, who his producer is going to be, what the feeling's going to be. If it's going to be a raw album, I, if it's going to be polished, you I, never I, quite I, know. But but what, well, let me just finish here. You're talking about you prefer Paul when he's not polished, and I think a lot of people look back at the '70s McCartney through the whole Wings period, and they like that period not only because it was a time when they were younger and they were more affected by the music, but they like that period when he wasn't as produced and polished. And most of the 70s McCartney's albums have a more organic feel to them, and they were produced by Paul, Mm -hmm. as opposed to once he got into Tug of War and later on with George Martin and Hugh Padgham on Press to Play and, and those producers they prefer the 70s McCartney in part for that reason. So in no way do I am I being critical of you, Steve, for that. Okay. So you're saying you're picking that album because you think musically it's the strongest and because of yes. the production and you just like that. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I think Paul always did uh, throughout his career go through periods of, of, uh, of slick records and then uh, for eva- different types of raw albums. Mm-hmm. I kind of agree – with Steve, that it, I like when Paul is being a little, a little rough, for lack of a better way of putting it. And yet, at the same right. time, uh, there are times that you can't beat a perfectly polished piece of McCartney. Uh, although sometimes some of his things have been a little overly polished. But um, uh, you know, uh, you know, Paul, I think, is unpredictable in that way that he could do, you know, an album that's a little rough. Around the edges like Flaming Pie, uh, throw a curveball to me. The sleeper in his catalog is Chaos of Creation in the Backyard. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, yeah. and then, and then do something like new, which is very slick. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anyway. Yep. I can, uh, I can understand that yeah. completely. Now, Al, right. now, Alan. Okay. Now, uh, we talked about this and you cannot pick Thrillington. <laughs> all right okay yeah i find uh paul's catalog kind of frustrating um because with his albums i mean i like a lot of them i can put them on i can play them uh and you know and enjoy them basically but uh, when it comes down to it, for me, a really good McCartney album has maybe four great songs. And a lot of the others are not just a little less great. They're Ue La Sole, which I can't bear. I, I just don't like that. <laughs> I just don't like that dancey, disco-y kind of stuff. And he sort of headed into that for a while. There was one of those on every album. And, uh, you know, I don't know. It, to me, that's sort of useless. Um, I was, however, going to pick Flowers in the Dirt. Um, and since there was such a long space between um, Ken and me, I was able to sort of, you know, look through the list pretty carefully and come up with something else. But um, the reason I would have picked Flowers in the Dirt is, you know, again, it, it, it is kind of like my feeling about the uh, of double fantasy with John coming back and mm-hmm. uh, you know the flowers in the dirt was also kind of a, a reboot in a way you know mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. it included those um, collaborations with Elvis Costello who I think was at the height of his powers mm-hmm. at the time and I, I think that I think that Elvis Costello pushed Paul in in the same kinds of ways that John did, you know, I love mm-hmm. those four songs. I, th- I think it is that, that they collaborated on and, and, um, and the ones that were on Elvis's albums too, you know, Veronica, stuff like that. Sure. Um, you know, I, I thought that was a really good collaboration. I'm sorry that it stopped. Yeah. Um, but you know, since we have already had someone to speak for flowers in the dirt, um, <laughs> I, I sort of, um, I sort of focused on Venus and Mars because we also had someone speaking for Band on the Run. 
Um, Venus and Mars is, to me, you re- really sort of part two of Band on the Run musically. I mean, it, it has nothing to do with it in a way, mm-hmm. but, but, but the sound of the band is similar. And I guess what I like about both of those albums, and maybe Venus and Mars in particular, is that it really was so at the core of Wings at their best when they were touring, you know, sort of we we had decided not to do live albums, but Wings Over America, I thought, you know, really sort of captured the the best of what Wings could do. And a lot mm-hmm. of that was was this stuff, you know, yeah. you know, I love the, the the way the title track goes into Rock Show. I mean, Rock Show was just sort of a, a classic, you know, meta. Yes. <laughs> meta rock song. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you gave me the answer, you know, it, it has a little bit mm. of that song and dance thing that he sometimes does, but it's, you know, it's pretty good. Uh, letting go, love letting go. You know, mm-hmm. we talk about the Paul being a little bit rougher than, um, you know, his, his slick side. I think letting go kind of, uh, has a bit of that, mm-hmm. um, and then there's those weird things at the end, you know, treat her gently and crossroads, um, you know, fine. I mean, there's, like I say, you know, I, I don't really have a perfect McCartney album. Um, there's there's always stuff on it that is a, a little second or third drawer for me. But um, but I, but Venus and Mars, I think what I like about it is the feeling of it from the beginning to end and my association with, you know, Wings doing these things live uh, uh, just sort of carries it in a way. And, and I think the studio versions are in a, a lot of ways better than the live versions for almost obvious reasons. I mean, mm. you have, you have time to, you know, that's work on them. And, that's yeah. interesting. I, I totally disagree with yeah. that. You know, the, <laughs> uh, the wing, the wings over America versions, especially letting go, you know, that's yeah. okay. so superior, mm-hmm. but you know, that's, that's my opinion there. Well, Okay, I'll and, give you that. And and like we had said before, with um, Figure of Eight, you know, yeah, that, that's better live too. Than uh, um, it's just that you know I like the slick side of Paul to a degree. Uh, you know, maybe not when it gets too slick, and I like the rough side too. But I thought that I thought Venus and Mars was a, a beautifully produced album, really, and uh, just just like the sound of it from start to finish. It's it's a very cohesive album sonically. Mm-hmm. Venus and Mars, mm-hmm. you know, and it was, I don't know if he attempted it this way. I've seen it. I don't know if I agree with this opinion, but I remember on more than one occasion uh, reading it, uh, being it, uh, it being described as Paul's arena rock album. Uh, yeah. mm. You know, the record that he put out to begin uh, the mega tours for wings. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, right. uh, you know, it, it, the sound and feel of the album really pulls it together and, you know, I, and and like you said, uh, Alan, I've always felt as much as I've loved virtually all of Paul's albums, almost every one of them, except in my opinion, Ban on the Run, has kind of a clunker in there. And for me, it's uh, you gave me the answer on mm. uh, Venus and Mars. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm. Well, I definitely think Venus and Mars Rock Show was one of the great album openers. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was it's the best. It still is the best song he's ever opened a concert yeah. with. Yeah, and it's so tailor made for doing a rock show. It was it was written with that purpose in mind, and it is a great medley there. Mm-hmm. And um, I do think, and we've said this on our show, Steve, and it was just you and me that uh, Venus and Mars and, and Wings at the Speed of Sound, uh, those particular albums work so well live. Those songs, I definitely think "Call Me Back Again" sounds better live. Um, I do have a bit of a problem with listening to what the man said live. I still prefer the studio version. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, most of the stuff on Venus and Mars, Spirits of Ancient Egypt, sounds great as a live recording. Magneto and Titanium Man sounds great. Um, Just about everything he did live on the Wings Over America tour, to me, sounds better live. To my ears. And uh, and I love the fact that he was gradually working in the other members of Wings uh, on these songs. Right. like Danny with Spirits of Ancient Egypt and Jimmy McCulloch with uh, Medicine Jar, which I thought was a great rock song. And that also worked very well live, too. And in that vein, uh, Alan, you mentioned that you felt that Venus and Mars was kind of like part two of uh, Band on the Run. 
mm-hmm. uh, because you thought you felt that the band sound was very similar, and yet Band on the Run was basically just you know Paul, Denny, and Linda. That's true. And um, you know Venus and Mars was more the second version uh, of Wings. Yeah, I mean, Band you on know, the may- Run. Maybe the way I think, maybe I think of it that way because Band on the Run also is so heavily represented in Wings Over America that uh, very true. You know that, yeah. that somehow I see these two albums as being as an entry the core of that tour. You know, yeah, yeah they just they just seem really related to me. Um, and yeah, maybe even more so than Wings at the Speed of Sound because that came out during the American portion of the tour. Well, more so than say Rubber Soul and Revolver, with but which both Paul yes. has to think of is related to each other. <laughs> right, <laughs> <laughs> very true. And you couldn't have two more disparate albums. Yeah. Definitely, right? Definitely. So that brings that brings it to me. And this is, uh, as you can tell, this has been uh, for all of us. This has been a very tough decision, and uh, because you know, just the volume of Paul's uh, Paul's post Beatles of uh, canon is so large, and they're so you know. Obviously, we did a whole show just recently on uh, on Tug of War, which is a, a wonderful album. Uh, mm-hmm. Flaming Pie. Uh, especially given mm-hmm. the circumstances under which it was recorded, uh, you know, while Linda was going through her ultimately losing battle with, with breast cancer is a wonderful album. Uh, mm-hmm. Chaos and Creation is, is a very, a very underappreciated album. Mm-hmm. And it was, and it was also very, um, uh, very different, uh, because of the, you know, I, when I first heard it, I thought, What's going on with all these songs of uh, these very kind of unhappy songs and uh, songs of kind of disillusionment? Well, of course, we found out soon after why. Uh, but it's still it's a, it's a wonderful album. Uh, but and and so are those uh, those seventies albums. But again, you know, I have to go back and and go you know song for song. And I have to agree with Darren that it has to be, it has to be Band on the Run. Again, uh, uh, again, because of, in a sense, the circumstances under which it was recorded. The fact that, uh, that Denny Sywell and Henry McCullough left almost virtually on the eve of their leaving for Lagos to, re- uh, to record the album. So it was, you know, with a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of side work done mainly in London. Uh, it was, uh, it was basically Paul, Linda and, and Denny Lane. And, uh, it's, uh, in, it's uh, and, and all some of the other uh, some of the other uh, obstacles that they encountered in Lagos, which have become legend. But the finished product is is just is is wonderful. I mean, you know, Band on the Run and Jet alone were you know were huge hit singles for uh, for Wings in '74. Uh, you've got Mrs. Vanderbilt, which has always been a big favorite, in which Paul uh, returned to. Just within the last couple of years, got "Let Me Roll It," which has been the, except for the eighty-nine ninety tour when he used uh, "We Got Married" in this way. "Let Me Roll It" has always been kind of the big arena rocker uh, that kind of you know ends the first set, basically since the album came out. As soon as he went back on the road. In seventy, in the fall of seventy five in Australia, he began using "Let Me Roll It," and as I said, except for eighty nine ninety, it's been it's been in the set ever since. Uh, "Mamonia," which you might consider kind of a, a, a minor song, is one of my all time favorite McCartney songs. And it's mm. you know, as Darren was saying about you know the you know it's 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 an album almost without a clunker. I suppose if there is one, it might be "No Words," wow. which is <laughs> which is not a bad song at all. But when you consider you know what else surrounds it on the album. Uh, that might be the um, perhaps the least favorite. Uh, that, might be, 
That might be one of my favorite McCartney tunes of, of uh, in the top five of all time. Yes, and <laughs> Mamonia, which a lot of people consider a, a kind of a minor song, is a huge favorite of mine. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm definitely in the minority. I, I feel that Helen Wheels being on this album sticks out like a sore thumb. Really? It's just stylistically, it's just, it doesn't belong on this album. Hmm. You know? I never felt that way, but then I've been used to it all right. these years that's, on the that's album. True. But. That's true, especially, you know, because here in America, that was, you know, that was included on the album by Edict of, of Capitol Records. Uh, so it's, it's just, it's, it's very close to, as, as, as I was saying with All Things Must Pass, it's very close to a, a perfect album. And, um, and it's, and obviously it's the album that, uh, you know, that virtually every other McCartney album since has been judged against. You know what? Much in the way that Ringo is the album that, uh, that all of Ringo's albums since mm-hmm. then have been have been uh uh judged against. So so Band on the Run is my choice. So uh that small consensus there uh <laughs> Band on the Run gets two gets two votes. But that uh that shows you the uh the, the breadth of the catalog. And we'll uh we'll wrap it up unless anybody has any uh any last minute comments. I think this has been a fascinating discussion think, and yeah. loaded with surprises. Yes. And with Band on the Run, I would add that, for me anyway, 1985 is one of the greatest songs I yeah. think Paul has done in his solo career. Mm-hmm. I do think Helen Wheels fits perfectly, especially when you consider rockers like Jet on the album and Let, Let Me Roll It. I think Helen Wheels just really, I, I don't know, it sonically sounds the same and... and I, I just, it's, me, it's a great rock song. To me, it was just a little too poppy. It was a little uh, compared to Jet and Let Me Roll It. And uh, it was just, you know, it was a little too slick and poppy. You, there's that word again, slick, for this album. It just, Mrs. Vanderbilt was poppy. Uh, it's, it's, to me, Mrs. Vanderbilt was more kind of offbeat than, than you know, uh, to me, Helen Wheels was really more of a, you know, just a, re- a slick um, kind of typical wing single of the, well, at least hmm. of the early period. Okay. You know, but... It was a great single for me. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> and, then, like, what... and like you say, that's, you know, all of the American fans, that's how they remember the album is with Helen Wheels on it. So, anyway... Uh, so, uh, as usual, we want to thank, uh, want to thank Darren DeVivo for, uh, coming on and, uh, as our, as our occasional guest panelist and hope he'll be with us again soon. Thanks for having me as always. And, uh, you can, uh, uh, Steve, why don't you give the contact information? Um, if you want to get a hold of us, um, you can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Um, we also have a, uh, we actually have two Facebook pages. There's a, a group page and a – I forget what the other page is, but there there are two things we said today pages that we monitor. And you can also get a hold of any one of us on Facebook uh, separately if you wish. And um, But uh, the, the best way to, to send your comments about the show is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And uh, one of these days we might actually do a mail a mail show. Yeah. Our, our mailbag show, I should say. We might even mention your name if you send us a note. So right. uh, feel free to to do that. Absolutely, if they can, if we can keep ourselves under control. <laughs> <laughs> there, there we That's go. A big there if. we go. And yeah. yeah, a very big if. Absolutely. So for uh, for Ken Michaels, for Steve Marinucci, for Alan Cozen, and Darren DeVivo, not forgetting him, and uh, myself, Al Sussman, thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.